all right, ah so thank you, martin, for the introduction. i'm going to be talking about my work which can be best summed up as formalizing the cascading style sheet language for web page layout and then encoding it to efficiently solvable smt queries and before i get into the meat of how we did that, i want to tell you a brief story about why so this is my first time in amsterdam uh, as any American tourist, I wanted to check out the sites, so I went to Amsterdam's tourist website, which lists all the fun things you can do in the city. Please check it out. I found it very useful, and probably the reason for that is because the designer of the site was thinking about me and my needs when designing the site. They were not, for example, thinking about my grandmother, who has failing eyesight and instead browses the web with a larger font size. For her, the page looks more like this. And you can tell the designer wasn't thinking about her needs because, for example, some of the buttons are impossible to click with this larger font size. Now, uh, I don't want to belabor the point that web design is hard. I suspect most of you have made web pages in your past, and I suspect most of you did not find it a thoroughly enjoyable experience. We know these jokes, they appear on coffee mugs and we tell them to our colleagues. And we also understand that the internet is now used for getting an education, for finding a job, for receiving health care, and really all of the very important things that we do in our daily lives. So it's really rather unfortunate that designers of websites don't have tools, verifiers, bug finders, debuggers, synthesizers, to assist them in this task. And now, our community has developed a host of these tools for other domains, and for general purpose programming languages. But these tools haven't been applicable till now to the task of web page layout. And the reason for this gap is that web page layout is defined by this large informal specification. Hundreds of pages of English text, millions of lines of C++ that implement web browsers, and of course test cases to tie it all together. What I have done with my co-author in this work is to bridge this gap with a project we call Cassius, which is our formalization of cascading style sheets and an encoding of that formalization to efficiently solvable SMT queries. So I'm going to tell you about how we did that. But before I dive into that, let me first talk about the tools you can build on top of Cassius, how Cassius is useful to transferring formal methods work to web page layout. And I'm going to start by explaining browsers. Now, we've all used browsers, so this shouldn't be too complicated. At a high level, you can think of a browser as taking inputs, like content in the form of an HTML page, layout instructions in the form of CSS, and some user preferences, like the size of the browser, and turning them into a rendering of the web page. And when I say rendering here, what I really mean is a tree of boxes, each of which has an assigned width, height, and position. For the purpose of this explanation, it's maybe best to think of a browser as using known inputs, HTML, CSS, and preferences, to fill in unknowns in the rendering. And our tool, Cassius, as a declarative specification for browsers, can do the same thing. But as a declarative specification, it can also do this in reverse, using known renderings to fill in unknowns in the user preferences and the CSS file. And this capability is very useful for building tools. I'm going to give you just three examples of that, three tools that I have built, prototypes, admittedly, uh, that make use of this capability to deliver uh, utility to web developers. So my first example is a bug finding tool. With a bug finding tool, we have some class of bugs we want to discover, like, for example, pieces of text that overlap. We suspect they only come up for some sorts of user preferences, say, some font sizes but not others. So we'll leave those unspecified, and re the rendering as well. The rendering constrained only by the sort of bug we want to find. If Cassius can find a way to fill in the holes in the preferences and the rendering such that this constraint, this bug, is present, then it has found a set of user preferences that cause our bug. So that's the bug finding tool. Here's a second tool, and I know I'm blazing through these, but this gives you a ta taste of what you can do with Cassius. Our second tool that you can build with Cassius is a debugger. With a debugger, we have some fixed HTML and CSS, but it produces an unexpected result. A box is too big, it's positioned in the wrong location, something like that. 
So what you can do to have Cassius help you debug is to provide Cassius with those inputs as well as the expected rendering. Now, naturally, these inputs and outputs are incompatible. And when Cassius detects such an incompatibility, it's going to produce an unsatisfiability core. That core is going to include a slice of the CSS file, so a selection of lines in the CSS file, that are necessary for the incompatibility. So you can use this to help you debug. The core selects a subset of the CSS file that you will need to look at to understand the unexpected rendering. Here's a final tool built on top of Cassius. This one's a synthesizer. It's a example-driven inductive synthesizer, you might call it. So we have several rendering and preference pairs that you provide. And Cassius is going to use them to fill in unknowns in the CSS file. So here, a solution found by Cassius is a way to fill in holes in your CSS file and produce a style sheet given your examples. So that's three examples of tools that you can build on top of Cassius. And I'm sure that those of you in this room can think of more. So now that I've discussed using Cassius, let's go on to how it's built. And the first step of that was formalizing CSS. Now naturally, the place to start was the standards document that's produced by a coalition of different browsers who want to make sure that their browsers render pages in the same way. But while sometimes this standards document is pretty formal, giving formulas that you can easily translate into mathematics. At other times, it is frustratingly ambiguous, like cases where it asks browsers to make a guess as to, as to what the user probably intended. Even more unfortunate is that these ambiguities in the standard are nonetheless relied upon, or their interpretation by browsers is nonetheless relied upon by web developers. So a formalization of CSS that's useful in practice cannot include only the formal parts. It must also include how browsers have chosen to interpret these ambiguities. So we could, of course, go into browser inter implementations to find this interpretation. Unfortunately, those browser implementations are millions of lines of C++ code. And that C++ code is often focused not just on rendering, but on interaction with the operating system, just-in-time compilation, networking, and so on. Luckily. We found a way to glue the, the browser implementations to the standard. And that's through a collection of test cases produced by the World Wide Web Consortium. The way these test cases work are that you use your browser to render an HTML CSS web page. You then ask a user to look at the rendered result, read the text, and decide whether or not the browser passed. And somehow, the World Wide Web Consortium has had thousands of users do this for real-world web browsers, like Mozilla Firefox. To use these tests to guide our formalization, we ensured that our formalization, Cassius, always rendered pages that were pixel-perfect identical with existing web browsers. This ensured that all the test cases passed by existing browsers are also passed by our implementation. So through a collection of the standards document and these tests as interpreted by browsers, we are able to put together a first order logic formalization of the behavior of CSS in the real world. All right, so that's how we formalize CSS. But on its own, a first order logic specification isn't quite useful for building tools, because first order logic is hard to reason about. What we needed was an encoding of that to something mechanically reasonable. So in our case, SMT. At an abstract level, you can think of that as quantifier elimination. We're going to take our first order logic, which contained quantifiers, and instantiate all those quantifiers into some quantifier-free theory. Now, to do quantifier instantiation, you must know that the domains you are quantifying over are finite. And in our cases, this is true, because in all of our use cases, we have a statically known HTML tree. Now, we could naively instantiate quantifiers, given this fact, but there was a key challenge we had to overcome, and that's keeping the number of constraints we generate small. By generating relatively few constraints, in our case only tens of thousands, we can, we can give the SMT solver a problem that it can reasonably solve. There are several things we had to do to achieve this, to overcome this challenge. I'm going to tell you about two of them. The first is a modification we had to do to our formalization. You see, in general, 
in CSS, every box, so this layout, can depend on every preceding box that floats. So you have this quadratic number of overall dependencies, which leads to a large number of constraints to handle these dependencies. We found, and that of course makes the SMT query inefficient to solve. We found four restrictions on floats, four layouts, they're roughly illustrated here, but note that there are only certain cases where the restriction is active, that we can remove from our formalization, make impossible, that reduces this over-dependency. And note that these restrictions aren't commonly seen in real-world websites, and also can be overcome by adding a single extra element to the document. So it doesn't restrict designers who want to use our tool to, for example, synthesize web pages. That's one change we made to the formalization. Another change we, we had to make was to the encoding itself. Often, in our formalization, we are quantifying over multiple related HTML elements, boxes, or other objects. And naively substituting in all pairs of boxes into this formula would re lead to quadratically many constraints. We would like to replace this with quantification over a single box that we can compute the related boxes from. Now we can't do that computation statically. Those related boxes may depend on uh, values of CSS properties, and those values may not be known statically. So what we instead do is treat that computation as an oracular choice. If only the SMT solver were to choose the correct related boxes for us, we can do the rest of the layout. And we can force it to choose the correct related boxes by constraining these oracular choices with additional axioms. So with this approach, we can ensure that the overall number of constraints generated is linear in the size of the document and rendering. And note that this also means that the SMT solver will be doing a search to fill in unknowns, even if every part of the input is statically known. I'll talk in the evaluation in just a few slides on how we made sure that this non-determinism doesn't cause non-deterministic outputs from a formalization. All right, so let's move on to some of the experiments that we've run using our tool. Of course, the first set of experiments was the fact that we could build those prototype tools. But we also wanted to answer a few additional questions. Namely, that we've chosen a realistic subset of CSS to implement, that our formalization of that subset is correct, and that our encoding of that formalization is fast. And throughout these experiments, I'm gonna be using a particular methodology that I wanna take a moment to describe. What we would do is we would take concrete inputs and a concrete rendering as produced by an existing browser, in our case, Firefox. We'd feed both input and output to Cassius, which would either find this pair of input and outputs compatible, we'd say it accepts the rendering, or incompatible, we'd say it rejects the rendering. What I'm gonna be doing throughout these experiments is making sure that Cassius accepts renderings produced by Mozilla Firefox and rejects alternative renderings, aka incorrect renderings. All right, so the first set of experiments we wanted to do was to make sure that we've, we've implemented a realistic subset of CSS. To do that, we used a collection of five popular web pages, uh, Amazon, Baidu, Google, Wikipedia, and Yahoo, and we made sure that we can handle the CSS used by those pages. And I should note, we made a small modification to these pages before feeding them to Cassius, which is that we basically removed all of the text. The reason for this modification is that different browsers render text differently. It's actually worse than that. Different operating systems with different sets of installed fonts render text differently. So in order to remove that non-determinism and how browsers actually work, a non-determinism that necessarily is reflected in our formalization, we removed the text before doing this experiment. All of the other structural elements of the page were the same. So, uh, for all of these experiments, for all of these websites, we found that Cassius would accept Firefox's rendering of that page and reject alternatives, meaning that it must have, to some degree, understood the CSS used by these pages enough, after all, to render the pages correctly. Now, these are large pages, and we only have a few of them, so we wanted to be extra sure that we've correctly implemented the subset of CSS that here was found to be sufficient. To do that, we use these official conformance tests that are passed by all existing browsers and are used to make sure that changes don't break the rendering behavior of web pages. 
There are about 2,000 tests. They cover the 23 sections of the standard that we support. And of them, only six were, in only six did we differ from Firefox's rendering. And in those six cases, this was because Firefox uses fixed point and a cruise rounding error, whereas the standard requires exact rational arithmetic. Now, these were tests that, that Cassius accepts the rendering produced by Firefox, but we also made sure that it rejects alternative renderings using something that we call solverated mutation testing. You can see details in the paper. We generated about 20,000 mutants. Of them, only 0.75% fail to be rejected. I investigated all of those by hand uh, because, after all, any difference between Cassius and Firefox is worth looking into. All of those were due to legitimate differences between browsers, changes in font rendering or line breaking behavior. So those are cases where Cassius necessarily must accept multiple renderings. In other words, through our testing, we found no reason to think that Cassius uh, formalizes the standard any, in any way but correctly. Finally, we wanted to make sure that our formalization of the standard and its encoding to SMT is fast and efficient. To do that, we use those prototype tools that I described earlier and you know, that I've implemented and you can download and try out. So we would do things like synthesize randomly chosen properties from these existing realistic web pages. I also tried the other two tools. You can see details on that in the paper. Now, when we're doing the synthesis, we're doing it to many CSS properties, in some cases hundreds. And despite the number of properties that Cassius has asked to synthesize, it only takes a few minutes on this graph under five to do that synthesis. You can e see an example of what it comes up with on the left. Now, admittedly, this isn't exactly human written CSS, especially given, for example, the strange numbers that Z3 finds it in itself to come up with. These are the sorts of things that an end user tool, one that's actually a production tool given to developers, would have to attack by doing multiple calls to the synthesizer. These, after all, were only prototype tools. All right, so that's been the experiments we've run on Cassius. We're hopeful that it's useful for building more tools beyond those that we've described here to help web developers with web page layout. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions.